All right, so this is a, this is a new project that's you know, under a year old. Um, and we're kind of integrating the long-term approach of, of Jane and Diane and data collection with some new technologies to really try and get at, the, uh, in various ways, weaning and mountain gorillas and chimpanzees, the two animals that are most like us, that are most likely um, some sort of representative for where we came from, okay? This is in partnership with many, many people, but the Jane Goodall Institute, the Fossey Fund, Max Planck Institute, uh, my institution, Franklin and Marshall College, and George Washington University. And we've got cute baby apes there, so that's always good. Okay, so the first thing we, we aim to do in this project is to really well characterize those dietary transitions from exclusively feeding on mother's milk to um, that transition to solid food. And we know that, that, that it's a process, not, not a hard line. And the way we have done this up to this point is by doing behavioral observations, by watching these apes for years and years and years and documenting when they're suckling at their mother's breast and when they start feeding on solid food. Now, remember, I mentioned to you that weaning in apes takes four to seven years. It's a really long period of time. And of course, they're eating solid food well before seven years old. And so what we want to do in this project is really narrow that window or understand that window um, much better. And so in addition to this behavioral approach of really analyzing our long-term data for suckling behavior and eating solid foods, um, what we're doing is collecting a lot of ape poop, okay? Ape poop is gold in my world. Like, you can find out so many things from ape poop, you have no idea how stressed they are, what diseases they have, like what they ate yesterday, it's amazing. One of the newer things you can find out from ape poop is if you analyze the stable isotopes in that poop, you can actually figure out what trophic level an infant is relative to its mother. So you can measure stable isotopes of nitrogen, and essentially, if the kid is enriched in nitrogen relative to the mother, that means that that kid is still a trophic level above the mom, i.e., I'm still eating mom. I'm still feeding primarily on mom, right? And when the levels of nitrogen come down to the same as mom, you know that the contribution of mother's milk to the diet has leveled off, and they're eating, surviving primarily on solid food. So this has been done in one study in great apes, by Yulia Baduscu, um, and this is, don't worry about what the graph is saying all that much, what's important is that horizontal line is infant age and months, and anything above the line is when the kid is eating mom, and anything on the line is when the kid is not. And what this graph tells you is that around 25 to 30 months old, the kid looks just like the mom. The kid is no longer eating mom at that point. That's less than a three-year-old, and remember I told you that weaning occurs between four and seven. So they're nutritionally independent of mom well before they stop weaning, which is kind of weird, right? So we want to um, narrow that window a little bit more, understand that a little bit better, get more data from chimps and also from gorillas, because that type of work has never been done in gorillas. The second thing we want to do is figure out that huge window, four to seven years old, what are the sources of variation in there? Um, there's various theory that would suggest that that might change depending on maternal age, whether mom is large body sized or in better body condition. There's some theory that suggests that infants have to reach a particular size themselves to be weaned, so infant size for age. Birth order, maybe firstborn kids are different than secondborn kids. Maybe infant sex matters. We just have no idea what could contribute to this big variation that we see. So a lot of these variables we can understand from our long-term records, right? Maternal age, we know who these moms are, we know when they were born, we know how old they are. But, and I should say, I say that like it's really simple, it's only because these studies have been going on more than 50 years. Okay, so let me, let me, let me point that out there. That's why we know that. We know the birth order, we know the infant sex, obviously. But we don't have, or we didn't have until recently, a good non-invasive way to study size in wild animals. Um, Attempts to measure a wild chimpanzee or gorilla will fail um, if you ask them to step on a scale or hold up a ruler. I mean, you might not get the ruler or your arm back. Um, so we've had to develop ways that, that do this without disturbing them. And, and what's come out of um, some research actually on horses and other in mammals is this approach of a parallel laser photogrammetry. So essentially, you build this box 
here on the left, which that's the exact box I just built in December. You try to get it through airport security all the way to Tanzania, <laughs> which was surprisingly easy. Um, <laughs> And what that does is it, it, it's a series of, it's a laser beam split by two prisms and they're perfectly parallel all the time. And because they're perfectly parallel all the time, they're always exactly four centimeters apart. So you take that to the field, um, you give your collaborators the box, they put it on a camera, they point it at a chimp, and now you have a scale. You're projecting something exactly four centimeters apart onto a wild animal, you can use that as a scale to measure body size. Okay, that's, that's the, our little scale blown up because those dots are pretty hard to see. This doesn't bother them. These chimpanzees are used to weird people pointing weird stuff at them all the time because the study's been going on 60 years, so this doesn't bother them. So again, we're doing this in both gorillas and chimpanzees to, to try and suss out some of these sources of variation, new tech with long-term data.